list of things to get through. So why don't we get going? Um, Deb, can you uh, please read the roll call as we convene the Monday, May 10th, 2021 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council? Chairman Garvin? Here. Councilor Boucher? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Noonan? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I understand Councilor Caitlin Jordan will be joining us in a little bit. So uh, would you all please rise to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, undergone, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any council reports or correspondence at this point? And before we do that, I will note for the um, public that we've got about 17 folks uh, from the public joining us tonight, 18 now. But uh, are there any councilors uh, that wish to make any reports or report any correspondence? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll go over to Councilor Gabrielson for the finance committee report. Um, great, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. The um, uh, short short version of it is that uh, we uh, expenses and revenues both continue to track in line with expectations. Um, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Matt if folks have any questions. I have one quick question, Matt. Um, just um, what the folks over and I, I know we had parking. Uh, at the fort go active a month earlier than in the past. And so we're um, a month into that. And how did that align with expectations? Mr. Chairman, that's a great question. I, I thank you for that. And uh, mm -hmm. let me just call that up. Uh, we get our month, our, our weekly report uh, every Monday from IP, uh, UPP. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far this spring, it's been it's been a, a decent start to the year. Uh, we've been averaging somewhere between eight to ten thousand dollars per week in gross revenues uh, from each of them. Uh, so, looking at the most uh, at the most recent week, uh, which would have been finishing yesterday, the waiting for Excel. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, the, I don't need the exact numbers, but it sounds like it's going well. So. Yeah, just under ninety six hundred dollars in last week's uh, take. The week before that, eighty nine hundred. Uh, 11,135 uh, the week before that. So a lot of it, of course, is weather dependent. And if we have a really nice Sunday, uh, it, it, it shows uh, quickly. And so, uh, or at least on the weekends. Right now, uh, in the month of April, we grossed 31,800 uh, in, in gross revenues. And so far in the month of May, we're at 18,500. So I think that will help us uh, uh, attain our goal uh, that we had uh, set up for forecast uh, revenues for in display for this year when we get to that. Okay. Um, anyone else have questions for either Matt or uh, Jeremy? Okay. Uh, seeing none, is there anybody joining us? We're up to 27 folks now um, that would like to discuss something that's not on tonight's agenda. Um, there'll be public comment opportunity prior to each item. Uh, for items that are on the agenda, but if there's anybody that would like to speak about something that's not on the agenda, now is your opportunity to do so. Um, just use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting. Uh, you'll be recognized. I ask that you give your name and address or affiliation and keep your comments to about three minutes. And I see the hand raised of Nancy Kelly. So Matt will open up your microphone in just a second, Nancy. Go ahead. Uh, actually, this is Kurt Kelly using... Okay. Nancy Kelly's computer. And I, I wanted to just uh, make a few remarks about the, oh, the, I live at 374 Mitchell Road in Cape. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, make a, just a quick remarks on the Zen Company proposal. I listened in. So I think, I think we're going to be speaking. I think, I think we're going to be discussing that as an agenda item. Oh, I didn't see um, it. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll defer till then. Um, 
I'll defer till then. Okay. Is there anybody else that um, wants to speak about something that's not on tonight's agenda? And I should clarify when I say that we're going to be speaking about that later this evening, our agenda item number 21 and the agenda item number 87-2021 is on the affordable housing recommendations from the planning board, obviously stemming from an active development proposal, but the specific agenda item is about the housing affordable housing uh, amendments and recommendations, not specifically anything um, directly to the, the developer's proposal. But in any case, I'm sure that that'll all come up in conversation later. So seeing no other hands raised um, for public comment for items not on the agenda, move on to the manager's monthly report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, looking at the agenda this evening, I, I will try to be brief, uh, or at least give my best effort. First, I'd like to optimistically report that on June 1st, we are looking to reopen the Thomas Memorial Library, as well as reopen the town hall for not, uh, not for just, I guess, appointment only based purposes. So we should be opening the doors for folks to come in. Uh, so that'd be great. We do obviously, we'll still be offering curbside uh, availability at the library for those who are uncomfortable with, uh, with coming inside still. So we will have that there. Uh, some of the, some, you know, early as we get started, some of the stages will be a little less, uh, a little more conservative than uh, our normal approach, uh, such as looking for folks to do more of a grab and go, uh, but browsing will be available. And then as we go through the summer, we're looking to expand more and more uh, of the services at the library. But we are extremely happy to get to this point and uh, start to do that. And then the numbers seem to be tracking in the right direction. And uh, we're grateful for those who are doing their best uh, to do that uh, and, and keep us all safe and healthy. And then obviously town hall will be will be you know, overjoyed to be able to do that, but we're still happy to help but walk people through electronic transactions if they'd like to do that and save time and re-register their cars at home or whatever is most easy for them. But we are looking forward to seeing people come back into the building. On this Thursday, we will be having the electric vehicle uh, charging station bid opening. So looking to have that ready for once, uh, you know, uh, prospectively, if, if and when the budget passes and July 1st comes, we'll be ready to uh, start to deploy those units and get those in line and uh, installed. And then uh, finally, uh, being presumptive again about this evening's uh, outcome, tomorrow uh, absentee ballots will become available for those who look to vote, uh, would like to pursue the absentee function so they can, uh, Deborah has some uh, functions we can do on that, such as requesting online, uh, or else calling in or other different manners, but we will be available to process that or take in absentee voting requests as of tomorrow. So that's all I have uh, in light of the length of the agenda, Mr. Chairman, and by the fact that we've been meeting fairly consistently and uh, we, we talk about many of the coming events or current events on an almost weekly basis. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Matt about his report? Go ahead, Councilor Gabrielson. Um, just briefly, and maybe this is actually a question for Deb. Um, will the drop box be available for the June 8th election as well? Yes, it will. Uh, we're having it installed tomorrow. There's information being posted to the town's website if it's not already. We do have a new online request similar to what the state has for folks to go on and key in some information online. That request will come to us. We will uh, acknowledge the request as well. So that's a, actually a new function that I think people will enjoy having for the local election, election as well. But as I said, we're going to push all that information out online if it's not already. Uh, and absolutely the Dropbox will be installed tomorrow as well. Thank you, Deb. Any other questions for Matt? Seeing none, uh, our next item is number eight. We have draft minutes for our regular meeting held on April 12th and our special meeting that was held on April 27th. Is there a motion on this item? I'll motion to approve. I got I'm Nicole. Really accept the minute. <laughs> I'm gonna take Nicole as the motion and Penny, you can be the second. Is there any discussion on um, either? Seeing no discussion, Deb, could you call the roll call, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. 
Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, we have offered for a consent calendar items number 76-2021 through item number 80-2021. Uh, briefly, this includes the renewal uh, request uh, for the liquor license and special amusement permit for In by the Sea, the acceptance of a donation to the Thomas Memorial Library in memory of Peter Rich, the uh, authorization of a grant for the Kettle Cove Road watercraft launch, and the uh, consideration of short-term financing and bonded capital projects policy, which we discussed in workshop last week, and the consideration of the amendments to the fund balance policy also discussed last week. So on those items, is there any counselor that wishes to see uh, any of those discussed individually and not as part of the consent calendar? I'd Council like to Gabriel pull item 78, please. Okay. Great. And anybody else on anything else? Okay. Uh, so is there a motion uh, on the approval of the remaining items 76 through 80 uh, absent number 78? So moved. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Councilor Gachet? Is there any discussion? Um, I'll just note uh, that we had no concerns reported by the fire chief, police chief, code enforcement officer. I think I saw a representative from the Inn by the Sea uh, joining us tonight, but assume, uh, well, actually, we, we, I beg your pardon, we didn't offer opportunity for public comment on any of these. Um, so while the motion has been made, if there's anybody wishing to speak on any of these uh, items, you're welcome to raise your hand. I did see um, Mr. Briggs from In by the Sea, um, but seeing no concerns, I don't know if he had anything to add on his particular item. Um, I don't see any other hands going up. Uh, while I wait to see if any hands go up, I will um, thank uh, the um, uh, folks that have generously um, brought forward the donation for the library uh, in memory of uh, Peter Rich and uh, as well as Mr. George Morse who recently passed. Um, and also just want to again thank um, finance director John Corderaro for his work along with staff on um, items number 79 and 80 pertaining to the um, two policy, the two uh, fiscal policies. Um, seeing no other hands going up, uh, and a motion and a second. Uh, is there any other discussion on this consent calendar? Seeing none, Deb, could you call the roll to vote on that, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So remaining from that list was number 78-2021, the Kettle Cove Road Watercraft Launch Grant Authorization. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Gabrielson, uh, do you wanna Yeah, thanks, off? Jamie. Um, yep. Yeah, I, and I, I just, uh, I'll start off by saying I, I fully am in support of this item. Um, I just wanted to, um, make sure I had a question for Matt and I also just because um, you know this is a grant that comes the land and water conservation funding typically comes with fairly significant um, restrictions in terms of um, public access um, that's in, that are enforceable um, by the state I just wanted to make sure that we had adequate discussion of that my, my question for the manager is um, just wanted to make sure um, as we're voting on this uh, what the what the parcel is that will be subject to the land and water conservation funds is this just the portion of the state park that's used by the boat launch or is there any town land that's included in the LWCF restrictions? 
Councilor Gaberson, thank you so much for the question. I think they're they're both uh, fantastic. And uh, uh, first, the uh, the state actually recommended that we pursue this uh, application. They thought this program was 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 perfect for this. Uh, there are apparently a number of them that have already been uh, applied to uh, this park. So uh, they thought that, that that was part of the reason why they had recommended us to pursue this. It is uh, the, the section that will be under the, uh, the, the parcel land will be part of the state's parcel. So it's not, there's no town land that will be encumbered by this, but uh, we will need to follow by their uh, rules. But I think uh, by, by their definition and, and, and guiding us towards that, uh, direction to apply for that fund specifically they were very comfortable with uh the way that we were planning on using uh the launch as well as uh as well as the public benefit that will be uh, gathered by this if if we're so fortunate to receive the grant great thank you that answers my question if if, if i may mr chairman just one Go quick follow-up on that uh we do have a number of folks who do have uh you know, pursuant to some of our conversations earlier with access and uh we're, we are ordering uh, specifically different colored mooring, uh, for lack of a better way, stickers for the windows for folks who, who do have moorings so they don't get confused or caught up uh, as being out of out of line with the ordinance. Uh, it's a handful, but uh, having that handful easily identified, uh, we have them in order and we'll be mailing those to folks as they renew their moorings or handing them to them at that point. So uh, seems like a good fix. And thanks to <laughs> Councillor Noonan for uh, putting that uh, thought in there. So we are deploying that as well this spring. Great. Um, are there any other questions uh, or um, any other questions on this? And then I'll seek a motion. Seeing none. Is there a motion uh, on the item? Council Gabrielson. Move that the town of Cape Elizabeth author the town manager to sign the application to the land and water conservation fund for the grant funding and project certification for the Kettle Cove water road watercraft launch total estimate cost is $111,932.50 and the grant request is $55,312.50 with cash match provided by the town in the amount of $56,620 or 50.58% of the total. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Noonan. Is there any discussion? I uh, just want to, again, commend um, Matt and the rest of the staff, uh, ACP office, everybody there, um, uh, Town Engineer Steve Harding for continued pursuit of these types of things that um, certainly reduce the burden on taxpayers for um, these kinds of enhancements and uh, infrastructure work. So really appreciate your efforts in pursuing that. Um, if there's no other discussion, we will call the vote, please, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next up is item number 15 on the agenda, number 81-2021, fiscal year 2022 municipal general fund budget approval. Uh, we held a public hearing on this last week. And if there's anybody uh, joining us from the public that wishes to speak on this tonight, now's your opportunity to do so. Before the council votes, uh, just again, raise your hand if you're interested in speaking at this point. I don't see any hands going up from the approximately 33 attendees in the audience with us right now. So is there a motion on the item? Well, you want me to read it? <laughs> sure. Okay, so we move that having held a public hearing on May 3rd, 2021, the Town Council does hereby adopt the Municipal General Fund Operating and CIP Expenditure Budget for fiscal year 2022 of $16,857,021, not including overlay, with estimated non-property tax revenues of $10,018,272 and estimated property taxes of $6,838,749, 
and hereby adopt the following revenue budget and gross appropriations for each listed department as follows. Thank you. And those are included uh, in included. the packet uh, with the agenda. Is there a second to that? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? Councillor Devereaux. I was just hoping that um, Matt might um, give just an overview of the updated uh, pro forma for people who are listening in. By all means, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Devereaux. That's a uh, Again, I don't I don't tee these questions up, so I, uh, I have, <laughs> I'm grateful for you asking that. Uh, since we last met uh, last week and we were discussing uh, the, this year's budget, we have adjusted revenues based on uh, state revenue sharing numbers that we have on the current books, as well as what we're forecast for next year. And uh, you'll notice that the one change that uh, had taken place from last week was an increase in revenues by $200,000, which resulted in the town's tax rate, instead of increasing by 14 cents, to be increasing by three cents uh, for a three quarters of 1% increase to the tax rate overall uh, and to the overall budget and our overall tax rate of an increase to the tax rate of 2.86%. So uh, we're extremely happy to bring that forward and to help uh, offset the burden to, to Cape Elizabeth property taxpayers. And uh, I hope that, that this information finds. Uh, finds a positive positive landing. So we are happy to do that, but that is the update from last week. Uh, and the expenditures did stay the same. So it was just a, it was a mathematical function of, of increasing the revenues and the, the positive benefit to the tax rate. Thank you for the question. Thank you, ahead, thank, you Matt. Uh, thank, thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, Chairman Garvin. I just wanted to say that I, I really wanna commend you and the department heads for doing such a fabulous job this year and last year putting together the budget when uh, we were in the uh, start of a pandemic. Um, you kept it real and um, did, a, did a fabulous job, job with it. Everybody worked so hard. And I just want to commend all of you for the hard work and uh, putting this budget together. Thank you, Council Devereaux. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, many hands make light work. And I am truly blessed to have some excellent department heads, and great, great folks working for, for the town. And uh, you know, the, these, these are Herculean efforts and we've got a great council to work with to bring this forward and your support means a tremendous amount to myself as well as the staff. So uh, we try to do our best and uh, yeah, we're truly blessed to have some great folks working for us. So they, they do the heavy lifting. Thank you for that. I'll pass those comments along. Any other discussion? Um, seeing none, uh, we'll go to the vote, please, Deb. Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is number 82-2021, the fiscal year 2022 school budget approval. Uh, again, uh, we held a public hearing on this last week uh, and our tonight, uh, our agenda item is uh, whether or not to approve the amount recommended in proposed expenditures and revenues for the school budget on to uh, the referendum vote in June. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this item. I see no hands going up. Are there any counselors that wish to make a motion at this point? I'll do it. Councilor Boucher. All right. Ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council following a public hearing on May 3rd, 2021 at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom approves the school department budget as recommended by the school board for fiscal year 2022 for a total appropriation of $29,857,097 and estimated revenues of $2,558,689. You don't need to go through all the okay, items. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. 
Seconded by Councilor Noonan. Um, for anybody following along in the agenda and uh, in our packet, there's a detailed breakdown of source of funding um, and expense commitments and things like that um, uh, enumerated throughout the agenda item. Um, is there any discussion from the council? Councilor Deborah. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I wanna say that it, I think it's fabulous that um, our municipal budget um, decreased so much that um, we went from 3.41 to 2.86 um, in our uh, percentages of tax increase. And with that said, I, I really believe it's important for us to have uh, good schools and it's part of our social responsibility, um, not only for our children, but our community. And um, it helps create strong property values. That's an added benefit, definitely. But along with that social responsibility, I really feel that we have a social responsibility to everyone who lives in Cape Elizabeth, not just the 10 or 15 percent um, of this population. And I realize this is an issue that I see um, kind of through a different perspective um, as a single parent. And um, I've always had to follow a budget. I think it's important to follow a budget. And I'm really concerned that our school's budget has increased two years ago by 5.95%, last year by 59 during the pandemic, which is equals, I'm gonna round it to 6%. Um, this year it would have increased to 7%, but due to um, insurance not increasing and due to moving $300,000 for the design of the school out of the budget, it's really only at 4.8%, which is 5%. And if we think about that increase, if we continue to increase our budget by five, 6%, let's say 6% every year, then um, within 12 years, our budget's going to double. Uh, so that means our budget's going to be close to $60 million. Uh, I just don't see how that's sustainable. I think that um, it's something that we really need to think about. There's some difficult decisions we have to make, but um, I guess what I'm doing is asking people just to think about it and to consider what we can do, how we can collaborate, how we can um, work together on this so that we're not increasing the budget by six or 7% a year with a decline in enrollment, because I just don't see it as being sustainable for a lot of people who only received, you know, our teachers got a 3% cost of living increase. Um, our police department got 2%, our senior citizens got 1%. I just don't see how this is sustainable for people in our community or people who wanna buy homes in our community, families who wanna come here. So um, while I'm thrilled that our tax increase is not going to be as big as we expected, this is still something we need to think about. And I think we really need to take a hard look at it and work together to come up with some ideas um, so that we're not doubling our budget. When I say 12 years, it's really seven years because we're already three years into it. So do we want a $58 million school budget um, by 2029, I don't know if that's sustainable. So um, just some food for thought and um, I'm open to talking about it. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I love the ideas and the suggestions. So thank you. Other discussion from counselors? Um, I'd like to weigh in partially in response, but partially um, independent of that. But um, Councilor Devereaux, thank you for your comments. Um, I, I agree that uh, you know the council collectively holds the responsibility of being fiscal stewards for the entire town um, and making sure that um, uh, decisions are being made um, with that in mind. I, I, I'm honestly a little bit perplexed about uh, and, and I know that these are not new arguments that are being raised or, or, or new, you know, new criticisms about um, 
uh, increasing expenditures and things like that. But in, in this particular year, I'm, I'm a, a little bit surprised to hear it raised because um, this is one of the smaller increases that we've seen um, in the last number of years. And, and just to, so that we're clear on the numbers that you were citing before, I think you were referencing um, increases in expenses, but not the overall uh, increase in net to taxes. And this year's increase, uh, the school department portion of the budget is 3.5%. And so to combine that with the municipal, with a total net to tax increase of under 3%, um, you know, you, you always want it to be as low as possible, but I think this is one, one of the better jobs that both the town and the schools have done in the last several years. I also take a little bit of issue with saying, well, um, you can't really factor in the fact that uh, there was a 0% healthcare increase this year, because that means that in the years where they had unexpected healthcare increases uh, exceeding their forecast or estimate, you know, should those equally be thrown out as outliers because the estimates came in so high above. So, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I think the school department can be penalized for the good fortune of, of um, you know, of, of having, um, you know, the benefit of, of a 0% uh, health increase. Um, I'm very pleased with the process that both the town and the school went through this year. Um, I think each year that process I've seen get better in my nearly six years on the council in terms of being thorough, um, transparent, well-documented, um, and with strong rationale. Um, and I have, I have no concerns um, having gone through that process and observed that process um, with what, what number they've arrived at for this year. Um, I, 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 I agree with the point you're making about always looking for ways to lessen that impact. Um, and I think that's an important thing that, that we all should be doing. And I, I do believe that that is something that the school department did this year. Um, and it was stated at their meetings and um, stated in the workshops and, and budget sessions that they had with us. So. Um, so I support I support the school budget as I did the town budget, um, and um, uh, that's that's my thoughts on it. Any other discussion? Council Boucher. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we can't look at this in terms of one year or year over year. We have to look at the full picture, right? So, eighty five percent of the school budget is salary. And we know we had a lot of retirements. We know we'll be replacing with new people. Maybe there'll be people who are newer. We obviously need to balance costs of salary with experience. And um, we know that when teachers come to Cape Elizabeth, it's a great school district and they stay. And so that has a high cost to it. I'd argue that always caring about the bottom line has led to a lot of deferred maintenance over the years that now has cost us today. And some of those yearly increases are contractually obligated. So there's really not much you can do until renegotiations happen. So I just want the public to be aware that we do look at these numbers through the budget process in detail to understand why they're going up. And I also welcome any creative solutions. I love what John brought earlier with the self-funding financing. That was a creative way to look at something that we could do as a town to fund ourselves and do things like that. So absolutely, we should always be looking at all those things. And I think saying, why, 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 why has this increase happened? You know, why, why now? <laughs> and um, what can we do about it in the future? But I do think that this was a very transparent process and um, it's pretty clear where the money is being spent and why. Thank you, Council Boucher. Is there other discussion? Council Deborah? Just want to respond quickly. I, I agree that it's clear where the money's being spent, and that's not what I stated. And um, also, um, in response to uh, Councillor Garvin, I'm not penalizing the school um, because they um, didn't have an increase in insurance. What I'm saying is that they brought forward a 7% increase. Um, I used the 5%, not the 7%, in my calculation. And it doesn't change the fact that in seven years, the budget's going to double if it goes, if it continues the way it is, it is going to double to be $58 million, $57, $58 million. So um, I'm just suggesting that we look at all options 
um, ways to raise revenue and work collaboratively because I feel that it's important um, as a community to um, not only support our school, but to support our residents also without raising taxes to where it's not sustainable. I just think it's something we should look at. So I, I agree with you. I, I think what I'm frustrated with though is the suggestion in your, in your statement that that that's not happening though, and that there aren't people that are committed to achieving that objective. And so um, for, you know, either other counselors or members of the public, I would just say that, you know, frankly, that that's turned into a year round exercise for both the council and the school board in terms of trying to find those ways. And, you know, we can, we can say all day long, let's get creative. Um, and, you know, short of a huge infusion of revenues from an unexpected source or dramatic um, uh, or, or even in the example of the healthcare, a flat cost year over year to last year, there aren't really a lot of other variables at play. So I, I just want to, I want to number one, be clear that people are looking at that that way. I, I know I am, and I know with, I think all of the other folks on the council are, certainly think all the folks on the school board are, as well as staff. You know, I think about the work that both John and, and on the school board side, Marcy, have done mm -hmm. in terms of pursuing, you know, various federal opportunities and things like, I mean, you know, literally the, the equivalent of, of turning the couch upside down and collecting all the loose change um, in some cases. And um, so I just, I just, I don't want the public to be left with the impression that, what Councilor Devereaux is suggesting needs to be done isn't already happening already. Can more be done? Possibly. It, you know, are there are there other solutions that we haven't considered or thought of yet? I, I'm not closing any doors or or my mind to that, but I just also I, I don't want folks to think that um, that level of creative thinking and um, you know trying to figure out any way other than impacting the Cape Elizabeth property tax owner isn't being contemplated already, so. I, I appreciate that. And it was never my intention to suggest that. So um, if that's how it came across, I apologize, but I'm just saying, I think it's time for us to look at this issue. And um, there we are. Is there other discussion? Seeing none, Deb, can you call the roll call, please? Councilor Boucher. Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next is item number 83-2021, the proposed fiscal year 2022 municipal general fund budget summary motion concerning property taxes. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? We have about 38 folks now. Um, Seeing no hands raised, um, is there a motion? Again, having held the public hearing that we did last week, is there a motion on this item, uh, please? Okay. Council Boucher. Order the Cape Elizabeth Town Council having held a public hearing on Monday, May 3rd, 2021 does hereby adopt the following items concerning property taxes. One, fix October 1st, 2021 and April 1st, 2022 as the dates upon each of which one half of such tax is due and payable. Uh, 36 MRS section 5052. Interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each date at the interest rate of 6% per annum. Authorize the tax collector and town treasurer to accept or decline prepayments of taxes not yet committed or prior to any due date and pay no interest thereon, and four, fix the interest rate for taxes paid in excess of the assessment 2% per annum. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Second by count. 
Seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Deb, go ahead. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is number 84-2021, property tax levy limit. Um, this is a motion to uh, increase the property tax levy for municipal services to $8,155,119 in accordance with state statute. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, and I apologize. Is there anybody from the public that wants to comment on this item? I suspect not. Seeing none, is there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, once again, please. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. <laughs> Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up is item number 85-2021, consideration of changes to the fee schedule. Um, the Finance Committee reviewed changes to the fee schedule, which are included in the packet tonight. These were all recommended by the various department heads. Um, it is recommended that the changes become effective July 1, with the exception of the elimination of the catering and liquor license fee, which would be effective immediately. The effective date of July 1 coincides with a new fiscal year, gives opportunity for us to communicate and notify the public as well as for departments to post the actual changes. Um, included in tonight's packet is uh, a file that has a red line version of what all of the changes, uh, recommended changes are. Um, just for the public's benefit, uh, before I open it up to public comment, uh, there's in that chart, a column that indicates what the current amount is, what the recommended new amount would be. And most importantly, a column that indicates when the um, fee was last revised. Um, the council in its workshop um, previously when reviewing this noted that a number of the fees, particularly the ones being recommended for increase tonight, um, hadn't been um, revised in over a decade. Um, so this is partly an exercise um, to, to level up. Um, but we also in doing that noted that on an ongoing basis, um, we should be looking at these more frequently, even if it doesn't result in a change. And so we're gonna um, uh, uh, enact more as a policy, um, a, a regular review of these fees um, every couple of years to make sure um, that they're in alignment with, with where they should be. So. Uh, with that preamble and introduction, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no hands, is there anybody with the, to make a motion? Um, Councilor Gabrielson, go ahead. Great. I move that the council approve the changes to the fee schedule as presented effective July 1st, 2021, except the elimination of certain fees, which is effective immediately. Thank you. And Councilor Noonan, would you like to second? Yep, second. Is there any discussion? Um, thank you uh, to all the department heads for the work that they put in on this and uh, to Deb and Matt for all, and um, John for all the work in organizing it for us. Um, glad that uh, we spent some time on it and even uh, more happy about the fact, like I said, that we'll plan to look at this more regularly going forward. Um, and since we gave him so many kudos in our workshop, a shout out to former Councillor Chris Straw um, for this having been one of his pet items. So in any case, uh, with no other discussion, uh, Deb, the roll call, please. Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? 
Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is number 86-2021. We have a recommendation from the Thomas More Library Committee to amend certain policies. Um, Matt, I assume, uh, I think I saw Rachel uh, in the attendees, and I know that she's provided us with a, a memo outlining the changes. I don't, I don't know if Rachel um, wanted to briefly introduce this and take any questions, and then we can also um, see if the public has any comments. Good evening, Rachel. Hi there. How are you? Um, good, how are you? Good, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these are policies that, um, as you can see from the, the existing policies, um, they didn't quite cover the, uh, the issues that, um, that we have been uh, encountering over, uh, well, pretty much since the, the new building opened. Uh, a lot of increased traffic in the, um, in the library after school uh, in particular, and um, a lot of gray areas. So we have um, taken the opportunity uh, during this um, period of having our building closed to the public to really um, try and um, address some of the issues that we've been encountering and be prepared uh, when we do reopen to, um, to have new policies in place um, to ensure um, the enjoyment um, and safety of all who use the, the Thomas Memorial Library um, and to sort of dispel any um, misconceptions about uh, the level of supervision that children receive when they are at the library. Um, I think there's, there's in general a, um, a, a misconception that, that the public library is, is very much like the schools um, and um, that is uh, simply not the case. A, a public library is a public building open to all. Um, we don't keep track of who comes and who goes, um, when they arrive, when they leave, the names of people who are there and, um, and anyone can encounter anybody else in that situation. And um, so we really wanted to uh, put policies in place that, that um, you know, that, that ensure uh, that children who visit the library are um, safe and uh, that, that parents are aware of what the level of supervision um, is and um, to, to ensure that, that adults can also um, enjoy the library space. I, I know uh, a number of adults have, have found it difficult in those after school hours to use the library because of the influx of kids after school who are not being supervised and not um, at a developmental age to um, supervise themselves. So that's the, the crux of, of most of, of the policy. These four policies are the ones that really address um, use of the public library building and um, you know food, computers, um, safe child, vulnerable adults, and, and just general behavior policies. So we're really trying to put in place um, policies that um, all staff can be confident in um, understanding and enforcing and that we can communicate to the public clearly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, also, I just wanted to, for, for you and, and the library committee, um, I thought your memo was really very helpful um, in terms of the real life sort of examples and an anecdotes that you presented, which for, um, I'm guessing maybe some of the counselors, but certainly um, I'm guessing most of the, the public would not have awareness to some of the things that um, you outlined in that. So I thought that that was really helpful to contextualize um, and provide a good foundation for um, the recommended changes that um, are being brought forward. Um, I think also um, just, uh, appreciation to you and the staff for, as you indicated, using the time um, uh, that the building hasn't um, been open for general use, um, uh, that it sort of provided a good opportunity to do this work too. So thank you for sort of making lemonade out of lemons as far as that's concerned. Um, so um, before we move on, I will ask if there's anybody from the public that would like to um, 
comment on this particular agenda item? I don't see any hands going up. Um, does anybody have, um, before we um, go to a motion, does anybody have any questions for Rachel about the policy ch uh, changes or anything outlined in, in the library committee's memo? Council Gabrielson. Um, so just to clarify the motion tonight, we're, we're just referring this to workshop for further discussion, is that correct? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't have any specific questions right now. Um, I, I thought it was a very well thought out set of proposals and I, I look forward to, to hearing more from the library committee um, in, in a workshop um, setting. Um, and uh, again, just applaud the work of, of Rachel and the library staff and, and uh, committee in, in pulling this together. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Council Gableson brings up a great point. Part of the reason why we're looking to refer this to workshop over the summer is so we can have the policies in place and in time for the, the, the next school year as it starts and trying to uh, see how they all uh, you know, develop over the course of the summer. And uh, so that's kind of why we wanted to put it on your, your radar here and then we can advance it through the summer. And then secondly, yeah, I just wanted to counsel, uh, echo Chairman Garvin's comments. Uh, Rachel's done a fantastic job, and we've had a lot of long discussions on reorganizing, uh, you know, what we're doing with staffing at the library, and as well as uh, some of the policies. And uh, like you said, we're trying to make lemons lemonade out of lemons, and uh, like we did with the pool last year and other other procedures, when we found we had the opportunity to take a look at what we do that can improve the uh, the experience of our users and our patrons, then uh, this was a great great time to try to try to do our best from that side. And, she just did tremendous work. We're really grateful for her efforts this year. Great, uh, Councilor Gabrielson. Um, and I guess this is a question for either you or or the manager. Um, so procedurally, we would refer this to workshop for discussion, and then this would come back before the council for a vote. Is that the body that adopts the policies? Yes. Okay. Just thank you. Yep, Wanted to clarify that. Any other? Questions, comments? So um, I think we're looking for a motion still on the actual item. So yeah. moved. Council Gaberson, great. Uh, motion to uh, refer this to a future workshop. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Devereaux. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Go ahead, Deb. Council Boucher. Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Next up is, thank you, Rachel, for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, next up thank is you. item number 87-2021, affordable housing recommendations from the planning board. Um, if there's anybody from the public wishing to speak on this, uh, we'll open it up for public comment in a minute. I will say um, the intended action of the council tonight is to refer this to the ordinance committee uh, for continued review. Uh, there's not a plan to vote to accept uh, or change any zoning, vote on the amendments or change any zoning um, this evening. Um, second to that is when we do refer this to the ordinance committee, uh, I'm going to encourage all counselors to participate in the meeting uh, in which this is reviewed by the ordinance committee or, or meetings in which it is reviewed. So even though we're not all um, standing members of the ordinance committee, um, I think that it will benefit this item um, if we're all participants in that conversation. Um, so uh, with that out of the way, um, if there's anybody that would like to speak, um, I know it's not Nancy Kelly and I forgot I'm sorry, <laughs> your first name. So we'll go back um, to whomever was using Nancy Kelly's computer as the first hand raised. Um, and as soon as uh, Matt opens up your mic, if you wouldn't mind just repeating your name and address for the minutes, so. Uh, Nancy 
you may be muted on your own end too. Yes, my name is Kurt Kelly. Uh, Thank I you, live, Kurt. I live at 374 Mitchell Road in Cape Elizabeth. And I, uh, there was a little confusion in the beginning because I had questions on the Zanton Company project, which as it turns out is also our affordable housing uh, recommendations for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I know that the uh, town did, did really, really a, a very thorough job on the recent uh, short-term rental uh, question that came up and there were, uh, I guess a year and a half worth of uh, in studies and, and looking into that. And it, it, it's clear to me, I listened to the uh, planning board meeting and there's some confusion between is this our affordable housing plan or is this a high density uh, apartment building for our town green? My concern is that some of the comments that have been made is that the commercial development in the town uh, has died. Uh, there are a number of vacancies in our current commercial uh, space. And uh, that was part of the uh, 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 discussion around recommending some of these changes, these, these major changes uh, to uh, our, uh, the way our town uh, has managed uh, commercial space in the past. Uh, and doing that literally at the end of a uh, horrible, horrible global pandemic uh, and, and using up, uh, taking up uh, what is really set aside for commercial development there uh, is concerning to me. And I do think uh, that uh, our, our town has opportunities to, uh, to lay out really what the future of commercial development should look like in Cape. And uh, there are ways to incent businesses to, uh, to come to Cape. I know part of the reason that this affordable housing project uh, was being considered because it was offset uh, 250 feet or 300 feet from the main thoroughfare. And I would just like to say that most businesses don't rely on walk-in traffic. And I think that was a big reason why it was being considered uh, and the uh, doing away with the, the opportunity for additional com commercial space in our town center. Uh, and, and so I, I think there was some confusion in the discussion. Is this about affordable housing? If so, have we really looked into it as a town? A simple Google search will show uh, many, many uh, options that uh, other towns and cities, uh, Connecticut has, done, has had some uh, really, really interesting uh, affordable housing solutions that have led to uh, home ownership. And I just, I think we're, we're, we have to pause this and take a look. Is this really a, an affordable housing solution? Uh, and if that's the case, it should be discussed and looked into on its own. Are we, is our commercial zone dying? And therefore we wanna give up more space. I think that needs to be looked into too because we could put together a, a five or 10 year plan for what we want commerce to look like in the town of Cape Elizabeth. So I, I think these, these two issues have gotten confused and I, I just think we need to hit the pause button on this. It's, it's, uh, there's just been too much confusion. One other thing about the apartments was that there were some- just, Yeah, if you could just wrap your comments. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I should have mentioned a, a three minute, try to oh, stick to three minutes, so yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if I've exceeded yep. that. Uh, matter That's fact, okay. I'll defer from this point. And, and okay. thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Appreciate your comments, thank you. Um, I'm gonna continue with the public comment. I know that um, also uh, the chair of the planning board, Jim Huebner is with us. And when we conclude the public comment, we will um, uh, uh, tee Jim up to um, speak a little bit about um, what, what has been brought back forward to the council in response to the council's request to the planning board um, to review and, and consider the uh, requested amendments. But uh, moving along with the public comment, and again, if you could keep your comments to about three minutes, that would be great or less would be even better if possible. So we can get the most number of comments in as possible. And the next person up is Suzanne McGinn 
Suzanne, your mic's open. If you could just um, give us your address, please. Sure. Suzanne McGinn, uh, 1180 Shore Road. Um, hello, counselors. Thank you for your support and service to the community. Um, I support affordable housing to create a vibrant and diverse community within Cape that welcomes new families with children who could benefit from our excellent school system. But today I'm writing to express my opposition to option one, which outlines the affordable housing amendment changes required within the town center by Zanton, the developer. I oppose the town giving away land behind town hall to Zanton for 34 additional paved parking spaces. And I oppose using TIF funds to help finance this project. I would encourage the council to pause this project, not send on option one to the ordinance committee shelf option one and create an independent ad hoc committee to study affordable housing. What homework is needed is uh, gathering the 2020 census data, determining how many affordable and total housing units we want over the next 10 plus years throughout Cape, specific input from all citizens via a survey, a committee consisting of affordable housing experts, research how many other communities have tackled this topic with creative solutions, determine the type, location, and total number of affordable housing units throughout town, integrating folks into the fabric of our community. Define affordable housing because there seems to be some confusion about that. Traffic studies at the town center is where you want a majority of affordable housing. Financial impacts to support added vehicle congestion, town services, and land long-term impacts of removing commercial requirements to any town center buildings. Just because our town has done uh, a terrible job as a community by not offering any new affordable housing since the mid seventies, the section eight housing, we should not just accept the Zanton proposal because a developer comes to town with a deal. The 49 unit building with 36 one bedroom affordable housing units will not create the diversity the comp plan intended as outlined in recommendation number 83. I applaud Zanton for his good work creating affordable housing in Maine. Unfortunately, 49 units are necessary for him to qualify for federal funding and financial feasibility. Please dig into the question of who exactly would qualify to rent. It sounds like a retired person with substantial assets would qualify since only a fraction of their assets and their retirement income is needed to qualify. Is this the type of household we're trying to attract to our town center? I would argue more families would benefit living within town center where students could walk to school. How many other concerned citizens have you heard from in opposition to the Zanton project? And how many in favor to date? I would hope this would impact your decision to move forward. Lastly, I understand this is a huge topic for our town and should require the same thoughtful, inclusive process you just completed for short-term rentals. Thanks so much again for your volunteer service and the planning board volunteers who were given the difficult task of proposing several changes to our amendments to make the Zanton project work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Janine Carey. Um, Matt, I'll open up your mic in just a second. Go ahead, please, with your name and address. Yes. Hi, this is Janine Bizion Carey, 36 Brentwood Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Um, and I would like to pretty much uh, ditto a lot of uh, the previous speakers' points um, going through the current form and proposal for the four ordinances to be changed. Um, I have a lot of concern, it, and it seems to be not alone. I think I read somewhere that as of May 4th, you had 56 people that wrote against the project and only eight in support, 50% of which were real estate developers, so have a certain particular interest in that. Um, I agree in terms of diversity, which this town definitely needs, um, but the diversity really we were talking about a few minutes ago, our public library, we're talking about our school system, we're talking about the backbone of this community and those families that we want to attract and those diverse families are going to need more than a one bedroom apartment which sounds like really a retirement community to me, 
of which there are quite a few around the greater Portland area. I'm very concerned in terms of the height of the building. Uh, I think that there's a you know, certain flavor and uh, feel for Cape Elizabeth that this will not go well within. And I think we've had other projects that have done it well. So I would say, let's look at those best practices and let's um, continue with those. And in terms of the commercial space, I would, I again, you know, we look, we've seen Knightsville, we've seen where there's been mixed space. Um, I think that we've had some challenges in terms of filling some of the commercial space on 77, but we also haven't had the situation where we have a number of people with liquidity right above a commercial space flowing through that. So I would say, uh, let's not be too uh, you know, speedy in, in saying that it doesn't need to be done. Um, I'm not against TIFFs, but I think that only if it's meeting the desires of the community. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, what we want this to be is a vibrant community that supports all the other services that we care about. And really, we are, we've had a diminishing student population. We have lack of diversity in our schools. Let's prioritize some of that. And I would just say as much as we can to study this a little bit more so that we're making good choices because it's probably the biggest challenge and change that we're going to see in the or what we're, we're seeing for the next few years within our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up in the queue is Mario Magnoli. Matt will open up your mic in a second, Mario. Go ahead, your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Mario Magnoli. I live at 15 Dearborn Drive. Um, thank you all for your patience, uh, for listening to me for the last few meetings. Um, I, I want to say pr pretty much the same thing uh, as the last few speakers, so I'll keep it short. I just I wanted to ask the town council, again, uh, looking at the planning board's recommendation of option one, um, I just wanted to stress uh, and, and, and ask that you uh, consider both sides of this um, issue. Um, there's a lot of people that oppose it. There's people in favor of it. Um, I just, I, I hope that you, just like you've done so many times before, are willing to compromise and, and maybe give both sides a little bit of something. Um, so, you know, if, if, if this, this is obviously something the town council, the planning board, and many people do want, um, but I know getting rid of the commercial aspect of it, um, that kind of hurts a lot of the rest of the community that aren't going to actually live there. Um, so, so that's all. Um, I, actually, I support, affordable housing. Um, and I think the, the, the objectives of it is fantastic and admirable. Um, but again, I think we should have uh, some commercial space there so that the 9,000 other people in this town um, might, might gain something from that specific location. And I do understand the argument that yes, the 9,000 people, we do benefit from added diversity. Um, so I fully understand that as well. But just that's all. I'm just asking for maybe some compromise, um, then that's all. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I appreciate everybody tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Sarah Lennon. Thank you. Sarah, Thank you. go ahead, your address please. Hi, I'm Sarah Lennon. I live at uh, 54 Cranbrook Drive and probably to no surprise to you all, I'm speaking tonight in opposition of the proposed multiplex but I'd like to be clear, I'm very much in favor of affordable housing in our community. Um, but what I would like to see is a deliberative, careful process by which we offer true affordable housing, planned and designed for families with children who can settle in among us and feel welcome and integrated in our neighborhoods and our schools and the fabric of our community, not just plunked down in the town center and isolated. I mean, I think it's pretty clear when you move here, you, you get settled into the community through your neighbors. Um, I urge each of you to carefully review the housing and commerce chapters of the 2019 comp plan of which I was a member. Not just the texts, but I really, really urge you 
um, to look at the meeting minutes, the citizen emails, the chat comments on that special um, platform we had where we would post a question every month and people would have really, really interesting conversations. And most importantly of all, perhaps the survey results. You will learn there that we asked about exploring communal living, houses converted to duplexes and condos, infill in existing neighborhoods, and even thought about tiny houses. We really focused on how to spread affordable housing into and throughout our community. And to be honest, we did not spend much time at all, if any, discussing multiplexes. You'll also learn that we meant for you to put recommendation number 83 before changing ordinances or approving a new building project, not after. And uh, as you know, I'm concerned about changing so many ordinances across the town center. These have been around since the mid 1990s, that's 25 years for a reason. They codify what citizens have said over and over and over again, what they want for our one very small town center. They want small scale buildings, commercial on the first floor, a small footprint in a village feel. This has been revisited and rewritten and approved five times with five different committees. I'd like to remind you that Article 8, Section 1 of our town charter allows a citizen referendum on any ordinance change. It needs a 10% of the residents to sign a petition and then by law it must go to a townwide vote. Remember, you are deliberating about four ordinance changes and I just wonder if you think all of them will pass a citizen vote based on the feedback you're getting so far. Something to consider. Uh, I'm almost done. Part of the decision making, it seems to me, is to clarify exactly who would qualify to buy one of these units. Because if it's based solely on income, wouldn't that allow well-off retirees who have assets but no paycheck? That would seem to defeat the entire purpose. So I would be cautious of sending this back to committees and boards for further review before to before you answer that and before you consider and probably have a conversation about the, what the majority of Cape citizens want, which is, I think, being made clear. In closing, I want to thank Mr. Stanton, who seems like a really great person working really hard in a lot of communities around Maine to bring affordable housing to those who will benefit. I regret that the timing and the scale of his proposal for this time, for this town at this moment, makes it so difficult. I also want to thank the planning board for their careful work and I want to thank you councillors for the very difficult decision you have ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item tonight? Um, if, if I see one hand going up, if, if I could get everybody else that's interested, that would be great to get a sense of how many more people because we're just about at our 15 minutes of comment, so I'm going to ask the councilors if they want to continue with discussion at this uh, with um, public comment at this point. I see five more hands raised at this point. Is there anybody else? Now it's down to four hands. Okay, um, so before I go to the next person, does anybody object uh, among the council to continuing on with additional public comment um, with the four folks that we've got in the queue? Seeing none, um, next up is Alyssa Tarlow. Matt, will open your mic in a second, Alyssa. And if you could give your address as well, that would be great. Go ahead. This is Alyssa Tarlow. I live at 340 Ocean House Road. Um, I'm actually in a butter to the lots that are a part of this project. Um, I have lots of complaints as in a butter, but the majority of my complaints are really as a Cape resident because I was very excited about the plan of creating these buildings around the town green with commercial space and making this walkable, enjoyable um, new area of Cape. And um, Sea Salt is a perfect example of how commercial can succeed. And I understand there are lots of reasons why there are issues with the strip um, across the street, but I think that there that commercial definitely can succeed in this area. And um, and I wanted, but let me just say that the things I really wanted to say, which was this was given to the planning board as 
it, this this is kind of back and forth. It, it was given to the planning board to make these changes to allow for affordable housing. But let's just be honest. It was given to the planning board to make changes to make the Xantin project work. And that is what they tried to do and which they eventually did. This was a long discussion. This was not a home run on the planning board that it would almost completely went the other way. Um, and and the, the everything that has been done and everything that is being done is all about getting the Santon project approved. Everything needs to stop and go back to the drawing board and focus on all the things that others have said, which is how can we improve our commercial? What is the best way to do that? Who do we need to attract and how can we make this happen? What do we want for affordable housing and how can we integrate that into our community? And, and what should that look like? How big should the units be? Who do we want to move into them? Why do we want it at all? What are the reasons behind all of this and how can we make it work? These things need to happen before any of this is even considered. If we were to add all this density into town, how would that impact everybody? How would that impact traffic? If we give up the space behind the town hall, which was used as an ice ring, what are the thousand other ways that the community could benefit from using that space that we're gonna be giving up? And what do the residents think? Well, so far, the residents that know about this are vastly against this project for all of the reasons that have been mentioned and many more. And the residents deserve to have more say and, and to vote on this and to back it up one way or another, it seems pretty clear right now that people will not be for this for all of these reasons, but it's just being pushed through somehow anyways by the town, which I, I still can't quite understand why this is happening. If we, we change the density and the and the the building footprint, we will change the town character forever. And this isn't just for this lot, this is for other lots. And and they all could easily get developed. And maybe they'll all be developed by Xanton or maybe they'll be, be developed by someone else, but this will change Cape. Cape is small, it has a feel to it. There is, everyone needs to think about how do they want that feel to change and grow over the years? Do you want them there to be big, huge apartment complexes with large footprints in the town center or do you wanna keep the small town feel? It's very important to think about this and how things are going to change. So I just ask all of you, I honestly don't know the, the way the town council works. I under, I heard um, it's going to the ordinance committee. I don't really know what that means and where the approvals happen and if and all of that. But I, I would like to say that I think you all should be discussing and considering totally tabling this and starting where you should start at researching all of these issues before considering making zoning, four major zoning changes, accepting a TIF and giving away part of the of our community land for this project that the majority of the community is very much against. So Ms. Tarlow, can you wrap up your comments, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Francis Hayward. Matt, I'll open your mic in a second. Go ahead. Your uh, name and address. Please. Yes, friend, uh, Francis Haywood, 1221 Shore Road. Um, I have several concerns about this, um, not necessarily um, about this project particularly, but I have a lot of concern about the lack of transparency and the lack of publicity, which many, many people in the town uh, have suffered from, actually most of them, many of them, I won't say most, many of them not having any idea that this project is being considered. Um, I looked at the Cape Elizabeth website several, many times over the past month, months, and there is a listing of seven hot topics. Never has this project been mentioned. And this is a huge, huge project which will transform our town center for literally, and our, and our town finances for literally decades, absolutely decades. The town owns, uh, I think, many small parcels throughout the town. Have we investigated Habitat for Humanity? There are so many other ways to provide for diverse housing. 
which I, I truly believe we really need for many, many, many reasons. But I feel that this is like somebody, you know, coming to town, got a hot item for a hot price and, you know, you got to do it while it's available or somebody else will buy it. It's, it's a rushed process. I have not, um, I have not been um, assured in any way that the thousands of hours that volunteers have studied uh, our, our zoning laws and our town center requirements over the years and come up with what, with broad, broad consensus has been decided upon, it seems to me it's very disrespectful, respectful of all those literally thousands of hours for a few people on the planning board and the town council to absolutely negate four hugely major decisions that have been made about what this town has wanted their development to look like. I feel like we, um, Cape Elizabeth should be driving the bus, not careening down a highway which to a destination which we really don't know enough about. Um, our elected representatives should pause, 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 find a better way to communicate and to investigate for themselves what this project will mean. Um, I wrote a letter to uh, the town councilors to say that in, uh, one of our children lives in a town wherein if you are in the downtown section, if you're a business or, or a uh, homeowner, you have to make a visual depiction. You have to build the outside parameters of your proposed construction. And I do not understand why we are not allowing our citizens to see that because I don't think that town councilors, any other elected officials and or citizens have any idea what this will be for our town center. Affordable housing, diverse housing is very necessary, but we need to start from scratch and say, what do we want? Not was, what does the, the developer need in a fast track? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Nat Jordan. Uh, Matt, I'll open your mic in a second, Nat. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Nat Jordan. Um, I live at 6 Robin Hood Road. Um, I'd first just like to point out that it's not true that there hasn't been a lot of research put into this proposal. There's been a number of meetings, which I know all, all of the town councilors have been involved with, um, a number of uh, hours and hours of work on the part of town staff and the developers to research this project to respond to community members' uh, concerns around the, the uh, one bedroom issue, the, the senior citizen issue. Um, there has been a lot of work put into, put into making this proposal work for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to respond to the idea that this is unpopular among town residents, the 56 people in, in opposition, eight people um, in support. Uh, I'm 21. I don't own a home in Cape Elizabeth. I don't abut the property. I, I couldn't move to Cape Elizabeth and, and get my own place if I wanted to. Because the reason why there's such opposition is because the people that would move into this facility, into this building, are not able to be at this meeting. They aren't able to afford Cape Elizabeth. And that's the purpose of uh, uh, proposals like this. We, I think everyone in this meeting knows that in towns like Cape Elizabeth, multifamily housing and, and affordable housing projects usually aren't very popular. There's a reason we haven't built affordable housing in 50 years. There's a reason it's very rare that multifamily housing developers come to Cape Elizabeth with a proposal. Put yourself in the shoes of a developer, you know, watching this meeting and hearing these residents and deciding whether or not they should submit a proposal to the town about coming and, and going through this, this runaround with residents telling them, no, this isn't going to work because the, it's, too, it's too tall. There's no retail. I mean, there, there are any number of, of concerns that could be brought. Parking, building, height, uh, whether there's retail that's not going to be used, whether there's parking that might not get used. But the, the real crisis here is the housing crisis. I'm 21. I, move, I want to move back to the area, and I can't afford a place in Cape Elizabeth. Westbrook, South Portland, Portland are doing their part 
Cape Elizabeth has all this land and we won't even build one housing uh, uh, development in town center. And everyone, everyone um, in, opposition to the, in opposition to this project is saying how they're in support of affordable, affordable housing, just not this project. But I ask if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next is John Boltz. Second, John. Yes. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yep, Great. loud and clear, John. Go ahead. I, I just like to sort of reiterate some of the points that were just made. I'm John Boltz, 33 Phillip Road. Um, some of the points that were made by the younger Cape resident. And you know, while I understand the point at this point, is coming to this is coming to the town council right now is an early preliminary process around this particular project. But really, this has raised some fundamental issues about how we want to plan our town and what's possible. And I would say you've heard a lot of people say, I'm all for affordable housing, but I'm all for this, but. And the answer is, you know, that's been the but for 50 years. In the last 30 years, Cumberland County has grown substantially. All around us, Cumberland County has been growing. Rest of Maine has been actually shrinking. Cumberland County has been growing. Cape Elizabeth has been dead flat. And there's a cost to doing nothing. The cost you is things like what you just heard, which is that your kids and, and the generation behind you cannot afford to live where their parents live. When you freeze housing like it's been frozen in Cape Elizabeth, there's a cost to that. And I'm not saying don't do it, but do it with your eyes wide open, knowing that the whole county around you is growing and that Southern Maine is in a housing crisis. And I would urge you to set as a council some vision about are we really going to have affordable housing sometime in the next 50 years? And how is that commercially possible? What's it going to look like? Or are we just not? because you've finally got a proposal for someone that says, this is what the market will bear. This is what I need for my units. This is what I need from the town to make this work financially. Because if you don't specify something that will work financially, you might as well specify organic free range unicorn farms. You can specify it as much as you want. You won't get anything. So right now, there's two issues that have come up, one of which is housing and affordable housing. Please set a vision on that and make sure you understand whatever vision is set by the planning board is doable. And the other one has to do with commercial development because right now our brand in Cape Elizabeth is the vacant key bank building. It's right in the center of our town. Everyone drives by it and they've seen it vacant for years. That is our brand, whether we like it or not. And you can do other things about it, but that's our brand. And if we fail to recognize it, it'll keep being our brand. So if you wanna do something about commercial development and planning, do it, but it's separate from the housing question. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Mario Magnoli has his hand raised again. Mario, I think you had about half of your time left. Um, Noli don't like to cycle around twice, but uh, go ahead. And I don't see any other hands raised at this point. If there's anybody else that wants to speak, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, we're going to um, wrap up the public comment portion. So Mario, go ahead. Jamie, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, again, I, I know I can't speak directly to any previous uh, person. Um, I would just like to say uh, my background. I am a young Cape resident. I would have qualified for this housing for most of uh, my life. I grew up in or around this type of housing in a, in a town in Connecticut. Um, and I've seen what it often turns into. Um, I've, I've actually seen 10 years forward from where we are right now. I've had the pleasure of doing that. Um, I, I don't like what I saw there and I don't like where I think we are going um, because I have experience with it. Um, it. It is not, I don't believe it's the town's duty to house everybody. I would like to have a car that, you know, a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth own. I don't, I, but it's not their responsibility to provide me with a, a you know a Porsche, it's not. It, you know what? I worked very hard. My wife worked incredibly hard so that we could actually be in Cape Elizabeth. We paid extra to be here because we do not want the overdevelopment. 
We wanted this community. It is possible to get here. Um, there, are, there are no laws whatsoever that exclude anybody from living here. Um, I don't know, that's, I, it's just kind of the, the fundamental. We do have a duty, I believe you have a duty um, to honor the people that are here, um, who, who, who have made it here, who consciously made a decision. We did not want to live in Westbrook. We, I didn't want to live in South Portland or Lewiston. I could have, um, we didn't. No one here in Cape Elizabeth made that choice. We could have, we did not want the overdevelopment. We wanted to live in a place that is very small, uh, very community feel and, and not with these large apartment complexes up. Again, I'm okay. I'm, a, uh, I'm okay compromising. So although I, I say I don't want these apartments, that's true. Um, but I am also a normal, rational person who would say, you know, probably, probably just like most people in Cape, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll give you some, let's do affordable housing. Let's get some people in here who can't afford here regularly, but at least give us something, do commercial, uh, you know, compromise. And that's, that's what you do so well. And I'll stop. I, I know I'm getting a little bit emotional about it, um, but that's all. It's, it's not impossible to live here. Um, it's not, the crisis is everywhere. We're not going to solve anything by putting 39 people in an apartment and then making, you know, 6,000 people lose sleep. I mean, anyway, uh, thank you for giving me the time. Um, I appreciate it guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Nathan Zayton had raised his hand uh, to join as uh, the last person. So go ahead, uh, Matt, I'll open up your mic. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Um, Nathan Zanton, uh, 22 Eastern Promenade, number three in Portland. Um, I'm the president of the Zanton Company, which is the company uh, proposing the project in the town center. I just wanted to uh, say that one of the things that we're really proud of as a company is the way we take care of our properties. And we would like to extend an invitation um, to anyone from the public uh, in Cape Elizabeth who might be listening to this, as well as to all counselors and or any town staff who would be interested to take a tour of one or more of our properties in Portland um, or any, anywhere, any of the 11 properties that we have. Um, some of them are, are as old as 16 years old. That's the oldest one. And um, we're very proud that they look like they are were just completed yesterday, um, and and um, we be very happy to give a tour to anybody who would like to to check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, no other hands raised, and I think we've um, gone beyond our um, usual allotted time for single agenda item public comment. Um, I mentioned uh, Jim Humer, the chair of the planning board is with us tonight. I'm gonna turn uh, things over to Jim in just a second um, to give us a little bit of introduction and um, Reader's Digest version of, of some of the work um, that the planning board did uh, to get us to where we are tonight. I do wanna just um, quickly respond to a couple of items of public comment. And, and this is um, neither for nor against um, the agenda item and the proposed amendments. It's neither for nor against um, the potential development um, that's on the table um, that uh, has to do with these amendments. But there was one person from the public that um, talked about how um, this hadn't received enough publicity or notice or things like that. And I just do want to set the record straight for folks that um, I think this came to the council in... January or maybe even late December, but January. So it's been about five months or so that we've been working on it um, and the planning board and staff have been working on it. Um, and in that time, there's been, I counted up and it was just a quick count while we were talking here, um, more than five articles uh, on the website. There was a public hearing on the 16th of March that the planning board held. I know that the developer has hosted two, at least two virtual meetings um, for the neighborhood and community to participate in. I've seen multiple articles in the Cape Courier. I've even seen ads that developer has taken out. Um, and as part of that process too, I know that there's been um, different design schematics that have represented what the project would look like and things like that. So I just wanted to set aside the notion that um, this isn't something that um, folks have had 
any kind of notice about. Um, and I think the amount of public comment we're generating here tonight, as well as um, I know has been offered at, at different planning board meetings and workshops and public hearings, would suggest that the, the public is pretty aware of, of this, um, number one. Number two, um, I think a couple of folks commented on the nature of the potential residents of these um, proposed apartments uh, that would that would be part of the affordable housing um, uh, that would be built under these affordable housing amendments. And I want to be super clear that, and and I think um, Chair Hubner might expand upon this a little bit as well, because I know it came up in one of their meetings, but. The town council, the town of Cape Elizabeth, um, the developer, um, none of those folks have anything to do with the qualifications that are set relative to um, whether or not somebody qualifies for uh, this type of affordable housing. Those things are all set by the state. And so if there's concern about um, you know, what type of assets and, and what counts and what doesn't and all that kind of stuff, that's nothing that the town has anything to do with. Um, so I just want to make sure that the public is aware of that, um, and that that would be something um, at the state level as part of their affordable housing um, regulations. Those are the two things that had come up in public comment that I just wanted to kind of set the record straight on. Um, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. And Thanks for having me. Um, and before before you get going, I also just want to extend the thanks of myself and the council to you and your colleagues on the planning board um, for all the work you've done so far on this. Um, and um, as I, I think I said to you all when I joined one of your meetings, I know that um, the council put you all in a relatively untenable um, and difficult situation. Um, and I am personally appreciative of the way that you all um, in a very thorough and professional manner responded to that um, challenge that we placed you all in. And um, thank you for the effort um, that led to the, the work you've brought forward to us tonight. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Um, no, th thank you very much. Um, yep. Appreciate it. I, I like to say uh, we are never bored. So uh, <laughs> yeah. And Matthew, tomorrow we'll I'm going right out and buying an orange tie. All right. I will. I just want to say that um, I'm not going to regurgitate the whole uh, thing. We gave you a memo with our thoughts. I'll touch on a couple of background things and then I'll uh, make myself available for your questions. Uh, from the beginning, um, the planning board did not uh, they, they want to they had a minimalist approach to this. We we minimize the number of properties in the town center that could qualify for these amendments. I think it was like five to six lots, depending on, on, on some other things. But we did not, uh, we purposely did not make it available to a whole town center. Um, we had three workshops, three meetings, uh, including uh, you know, public comment. Uh, I should note, we received, uh, just like you did for the meeting tonight, we received a lot of emails and people that were against it. But, um, Surprisingly, we got a lot of people that were in favor of it. So uh, as you know, mostly you hear people uh, speak out against whatever it may be, but there's a surprising number of people that were in favor of this because they can't, they want to live here and they can't afford to. Um, so we came up with two options. Uh, the first one, option one, uh, amended the building height, the building density, footprint, and allowed uh, living units on the first floor. Option two, the only difference is um, there was no, yet you, they, you kept the first floor commercial. I should also say we had some parking uh, amendments and we included in option one, uh, we expanded the definition of a mixed use building. At the April 20th meeting, we passed option one, which is all four amendments that the developer had requested uh, pass it by a four to two vote. Uh, it was, we had some very uh, serious and I would say contentious, but there was definitely people in favor, of it, people against it. It was a very interesting discussion in the planning board. Uh, but everybody, even besides that, but everybody in planning board was in favor of the, uh, the recommendation 83 from the comprehensive plan to 
uh, invent to to delegate that to the proper uh, body and the town to uh, to flesh that out. Um, of note, when whoever, whatever body you give that to, it may be the planning board and maybe somebody else. Um, there's an, uh, a letter from Randy Blake that was included in the uh, information you have. Uh, he's very knowledgeable at May, about the main state housing rules and we, whatever is decided upon should it, uh, include, uh, they should be knowledgeable about that so we don't exclude uh, any, or have any, have any amendments that would exclude people from qualifying, not qualifying for any, any project that goes forward. So we need to be knowledgeable about that. There was also on the planning board, we, there was discussion, there was no decision about should we mandate a certain number of bedrooms uh, for any proposed affordable housing complex. So um, anyway, with that, I will open it up to your, to your questions. Am I, I can't hear anybody. Oh, sorry, I was on mute, Jim. Uh, thank okay. you very much. Um, okay. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, one of the thing I was going to make mention of, uh, I think a question came up from uh, one of the folks uh, during the public comment period about um, this gets passed along. If we if we take action to move it along to the ordinance committee tonight, what does that mean? So on and so forth. Um, I thought I might take a minute to just um, explain that a little bit. So. Um, so the ordinance committee is the committee of counselors that is charged with um, uh, developing ordinance language. Um, sometimes it's uh, language that's drafted and, and, and created and crafted by the ordinance committee itself, uh, which was kind of the way that we went um, with the short term rental ordinances that have been referenced a couple times here this evening. Other times, um, uh, the planning board might draft ordinance language for us. Um, the town planner uh, sometimes takes the lead on those things. In any case, the ordinance committee is the committee that effectively um, vets, reviews, makes changes, um, gets things to a point where then it brings back to the full council for consideration um, and ultimately approval or not of, um, of whatever their recommendation is. So. Uh, the process on this would be if the council votes tonight to move this along to the ordinance committee is that they would have um, you know a meeting or series of meetings um, which are all open to the public and there's opportunity for public comment that um, at which point um, you know in in more of a workshop fashion um, kind of digging into some of the specifics asking some of the questions that have been raised um, seeking outside opinion if necessary um, so on and so forth. So um, I, I don't have any indication since this hasn't been referred to the ordinance committee yet, you know, how many meetings that would take or, or how long that would uh, transpire or anything like that. But um, with other items that, you know, works its way through that process and then comes back to the town council and the council can then either vote to adopt or not um, the recommendation of the ordinance committee. Um, so, is there anybody from the council that has questions for Jim uh, uh, or uh, questions generally about this item? I guess so I have a Council question. Member, go ahead. Well, we're, we're talking about um, sending this to the uh, ordinance committee. Are we Correct. talking about um, the uh, option number one that was passed and the item number 83 or just um, option number one? That's for us to decide here now as part of this. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Noonan, were you raising your hand? I Sorry. was hovering, but yes, I guess okay. I am. <laughs> Um, just to add on or to follow up on what um, Valerie just said, I, that's a great question. And I would um, recommend maybe that I'm fully in favor of um, addressing comprehensive plan recommendation number 83. I don't know 
uh, if the ordinance committee would be the right place. I wonder if we would workshop that to figure out, you know, how we want to proceed if we need some sort of ad hoc committee or, um, but those are sort of my thoughts of, that maybe it goes to a workshop, um, but I'm fully in favor of that. Um, but I, I, I just want to actually take the opportunity to say, in terms of that, I'm fully in favor of that, but I also think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, there's a developer that came to us, and I'm saying this just in response to some of the comments that we got tonight. They came to us with a request that we revise, um, make some amendments to an ordinance. And I don't know legally exactly what our, um, what we need to do there, but certainly as good process, we would go through considering considering the town-wide plan to increase um, affordable housing at the same time. I don't think that it's one or the other. So um, I feel confident that we can consider both at the same time and still be doing our, doing our, uh, doing a good job for the community, so. Thank you, Councilor Noonan. Other discussion? Um, does anybody have a motion that they'd like to put on the table at this point? I would like to Council make a Devera? motion. Go ahead, Council Devera. I'd like to make a motion that we um, delegate um, number 83 to an independent ad hoc committee to um, study affordable housing. Um, motion by Council Devereaux. Is there a second for that? I have a question in process. Would we have to workshop that first to decide what their charge would be? Yep. So, so there'd be a lot of. Motion be to go to a yeah. workshop. Um, so there'd be, I think, several things from a detailed perspective to work out as far as that's concerned, um, both creating a charge for the committee, um, determining composition, all that kind of thing. Um, I think it can be discussion amongst the council if this motion moves forward, um, whether that be the appointments committee um, that would take on the task of uh, first um, creating the charge and, and whether or not um, it would require any ordinance committee work um, under the boards and commissions ordinances to create the ad hoc committee. So, so a, 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 the short answer is several complicated steps after the fact, I guess, is the answer to your question. But I think the crux of it, if I'm not to put words in your mouth, Councilor Devereaux, but your objective is, however that's created, that uh, uh, non-currently standing, non-currently appointed group look at uh, and study affordable housing policy, make policy recommendations for the council. Is that how I understand your motion? Yes, similar to how we created the Civil Rights Committee. We um, made a motion, we created the committee, it was sent to the um, ordinance committee to come up with a charge. It came back to the council and then um, the committee was um, established. So it's the same steps that we've already taken to create the civil rights committee. We would create a, um, an independent ad hoc committee. That way um, it's independent people assessing the impacts and, and like John both said, um, you know, let's, let's create a vision. Um, let's decide what our, our vision is going to be and um, what better way to do it than have an independent committee do that. So I have a motion on the floor. Is there a second for the motion? I'll second it. Seconded by Council Boucher. Is there any discussion? Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. I, 
I'm not sure this is a very defined question, but what are there any other options that we can think of? I mean, I, I like the sound of that. Maybe that's where my head was going to, but I'm just wondering if we're missing another option. Does anyone have? I can't think of anything, but. Um, if I, I, I'm not saying I either favor or not either mm -hmm. Councillor Devereaux's motion or the alternative that I'm about to suggest, but, um, you know, I know early on in the process uh, of, uh, uh, of considering these amendments, um, the former Portland city planner, Jeff Levine came to a port, came to one of the planning boards meetings or workshops on this. He and, and, and other professionals like him, um, you know, do work in this space all the time. Um, I would consider another option to creating a committee to effectively outsource it to somebody who whose professional work is in this space um, and who has the expertise. Um, there's, you know, I think I think a number of different ways to um, to help advise the council in this regard. So whether that's a committee or um, hiring some subject matter expert. Would the committee have the ability, and I guess it depends on how we write up their charge for them, but to suggest something like that to us? So they could suggest that we hire someone, if they so chose to suggest. I'm just saying it's not one or the other necessarily. It's Yeah, I, I, get, I mean, every committee, it you Works. know, serves the council in advisory capacity. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a standing committee, whether it's an ad hoc committee that we've yet to even determine whether we want or need, um, mm -hmm. all of all of those exist to advise the council. Council can provide the direction that is necessary to getting the information that we feel we need to make a decision and, and to create policy. Councilor um, so Devereaux. Uh, well, I think that could be part of the charge that um, that they do that. And then that way, the committee would also be a deliberative process, um, kind of like the comp committee met with people from the community, reviewed the comp plan. There were a lot of things that, that they did that um, an independent outside person may not do. There may be other impact studies, um, traffic studies, things that I think we've done some of them in the, in, in the town. Um, we have a lot of research to do that um, I don't know that one independent person that we hire is going to do all of that research. And then when would they bring the research to us? Um, do, we, do we all have a, um, a workshop dedicated just to that? Uh, possibly, but if we had a, a committee working on it, then it just seems that um, a lot more could get done a lot quicker than bringing it back to us and in pieces. Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, I just want to say that um, there's a lot of work being done by experts in the area around uh, affordable housing, low income housing. Uh, a, I would not want to um, recreate all of the work that's being done currently. So I would like to find a way that we can uh, leverage that work that's happening um, and ensure that the uh, citizens in town feel as though uh, their, their voice is being heard. And this is just the, a germ of an idea, but why couldn't we somehow engage an expert and have their part of their charge as outreach to citizens and that they actually um, uh, report back to the town council so that we're uh, all engaged on an on, on ongoing basis uh, or they could report back to the ordinance committee, something along those lines. I, I worry about uh, creating a committee that's going to die, try, dive into something and problem solving around things that are already happening in um, 
in every community at this point in time, and there are experts out there doing that. And I'd like to find ways to leverage that. And I don't know where GT COG is at on this whole thing, but I know there's a ton of legislation that's put forward around affordable housing. They're trying to figure out how can we get this, make this happen. So I'm not I'm not in support of creating another committee. I'm in support of leveraging expertise um, in a way that will be effective around problem solving. So. Uh, Caitlin, you're next. I was gonna say the same thing as Penny. I completely agree. I am not in favor of creating another ad hoc committee, but I like the idea that she suggested of let's find the people who have already started doing this work and let's have them engage our citizens and go from there. That's a much better plan. Councilor Boucher. I'm all for leveraging expertise that other people have, but who is going to be reading that research and contacting them and having meetings with them and understanding all of that. And that, I think that's the crux of the problem. Um, I kind of go back to the workshop we had a few days ago about pesticides and there's a lot of information about pesticides out there that we know already and you know some people on the council decided like it sounds like a better idea to study it more so this is an even bigger um, societal impact and I would argue there might be significant differences between Cape Elizabeth's affordable housing environment and South Portland and Portland's. So a, as much as I don't want to slow the process down by creating another ad hoc um, committee, I, I do think this is a significant amount of legwork that does require uh, a team of people focusing on all of these issues. Council Gabrielson. Thank you. I, I think I tend to agree with with Penny and, and Caitlin on this one. Um, I think it would be helpful to us to have some guidance from fo from folks who are experts in the field. I, I think it, I, a lot of these conversations are ones that have been happening in neighboring communities that the manager and myself have been participating in through the Metro Regional Coalition. Um, and but ultimately, I think that you know if we task a committee with reviewing this comp plan recommendation and coming back to us, there are a number of policy decisions that are going to inform those conversations along the way. And I personally, my preference would be to have those conversations directly at the council level about those policy decisions, whether that happens through the ordinance committee or through council workshops, rather than tasking an ad hoc committee to you know, come back to us with those policy with a policy recommendation that's going to be informed by a number of choices along the way. And one of the significant barriers in in the area, and particularly in Cape Elizabeth, is just the simple raw cost of land, um, the cost of a developable lot. And there's a limited number of policy levers that you can pull to to try and develop affordable housing. One of them is larger proposals like the one that the Zenton group is brought in front of us, there are other options. All of them have impacts on neighborhoods and communities. And I think those policy decisions are best fleshed out with, with input from the, from the council directly as we're going through it. Other comments, questions, response? Go ahead, Councilor Deborah. Well, if, if we don't have an ad hoc committee, who's, who's the one who decides who's going to get hired. Um, what we have a workshop and talk about, this is the person we're hiring. Um, how do we coordinate all of it without an ad hoc committee? Councillor Penny Jordan. Um, I can, uh, and I know that the comp plan was an ad hoc committee, but um, if you take the, the council as a whole, and um, I believe we have a town manager, um, that uh, we come up with what is the criteria that we're looking for relative to the expert expertise um, and that we charge our town manager with doing the outreach to kind of see who's out there on the landscape 
and then we make the decision of who um, who we engage to help us work through um, this this issue. And I, I don't disagree with Nicole that this is like bigger than a red box. Um, um, but I think that before we head down a road to pull together a committee, we need to know, and I always go back to this, what problem we're solving and what we're asking them to do and to uh, what degree. Go ahead, Valerie. Well, I, I agree, Penny, but um, whether we have a committee or we act as the committee, we need to ask those questions. So those questions are gonna be asked whether we have a committee or not. So um, I, I think that goes without saying, we, we have to ask that question. Um, I'm just looking at a committee as a way to get it done quicker, uh, more coordinated and um, uh, engaging the community rather than um, the counselors who are going to make decisions on um, the ordinance are the ones gathering the information. I just want this to be as transparent as possible. And it just feels like it's very transparent with a committee that isn't us um, running the committee. So those are my thoughts about it. Other comments? Go ahead, Councilor Newman. Just observing that um, it wouldn't preclude us from having a committee down the road. We could potentially hire someone that gathers all the information that we've decided we need to make good decisions. And then from that point forward, you know, some of that get, goes out to a committee. It, it could be just sort of a, a flip of the order of things. So I don't, I don't think we're saying we wouldn't ever have one, but maybe um, being swayed toward Caitlin and Penny and Jeremy with your thoughts about at least where to start with this. And then we can see down the road if, if a committee might be a good, a good choice. Council Gabrielson. I just add on to that. It's also possible that, you know, if we engage the services of someone who is expert in this, that they come back to us with a menu of policy options that includes some amendments to our downtown zoning that would allow for you know development at the similar to the level of intensity that's being proposed by the Zanton group along with a suite of other options that would allow for develop affordable housing development elsewhere in town and you know at that point there it, it may be worthwhile to have those you know engage a committee to sort through some of those broader options around you know what would be needed to incentivize appropriate development of affordable housing in other zones or in multiple zones um you know because it could potentially become a fairly complex question Additional thought. Uh, go ahead, Matt. You want to jump in? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if, if the council is inclined to, you know, pursue professionals, we could craft an RFP uh, to to pursue that and put that out there. There are, and there is a very limited, uh, I guess, set of, of of practitioners in this specified uh, specific subject uh, that we but we could reach out to them. I know, uh, you know, Jeff Levine is one, and he's done a lot of extensive work in the Greater Portland area that Councilor Gabrielson did. Uh, uh, mentioned as well as uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and his report out to the planning board, which he's got a fairly strong pulse on the on what's going on in the market. Uh, there are others who we could also reach out to, or at least put it out there to see what we would re receive back. We just want to define exactly as Councilor Jordan, uh, Penny Jordan, had noted. What do you, you know, what is it that you want to? I guess we'll have to de define the problem and uh, identify what the desire is to have, uh, which questions asked and answered uh, to come back to make a recommendation to council. And uh, so, I mean, that's something we could craft, uh, probably have, want to sit down and do a workshop with council to to kind of explore that area to, to and then codify it into an RFP as, as the elements that you'd want to be have explored and then just have to figure out how, uh, you know, 
there would be a, there would obviously be a, a funding question attached to it, but that's nothing like anything else you encounter during the, the course of a year or so. Uh, that's something that can be addressed by council. So we, that's something we could make happen if the council so chooses. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm not. I'm not in support of um, adding an additional committee to be singularly focused on this. What I would like to do is continue uh, down the path that we're on, having the ordinance committee do that work with the um, uh, outside expertise that we've just been discussing. Um, I think I think we'll actually get to um, get to the endpoint um, more efficiently um, through that. Um, by part by having us be participants in that directly and, and like I said at the outset I, I would encourage all counselors to to be active actively involved in that ordinance committee work um, as opposed to just the the three standing members um, alone um, I, I'm you know that all notwithstanding uh, in the, the motion on the table is whether or not to create an ad hoc committee um, separately I'll comment that you, you know I'm personally, um fine with option number one and advancing that to the ordinance committee um and and moving forward down the, the process that we're going down um as far as um you know what that what the rest of that process looks like um you know there there will be um ample subsequent opportunity um as part of any prospective development whether it be the one that's been brought forward, or um, any that were to follow, if that one, you know, didn't wind up materializing, that look at many of the questions that have been asked and raised about impacts and and you know traffic and all of those kinds of things. Um, the decision on whether or not to move forward with zoning amendments that would allow for this potential kind of development don't supersede and i want to be super clear on this don't supersede the process that any development would need to go through as part of the normal planning process site plan review site plan approval impact studies all of those kinds of things and i think that there's um, a lot of consternation about any decision around these potential amendments serving as a you know uh go directly you know to boardwalk collect your two hundred dollars um you know advance advance straight to boardwalk kind of thing and that's not how the process works um and so even even in early um timelines that we looked at with the prospective developer there was a, a, a cognition and, re and recognition of the fact that um you know there's there's a number of New, numerous and iterative steps along the way. Um, so I just want to sort of reestablish that as a foundational piece of information that, um, you know, before we get, you know, too wound up in who, who's making, um, you know, who's making uh, decisions today that, that um, effectively advance this thing forward. So um, I don't favor a, a separate committee. I'd rather the ordinance committee be the ones to do that. I'd rather we um, take advantage of subject matter expertise of people in this space. Um, I think uh, comments I heard from um, one of the members of the public about needing to create and establish a fully formed affordable housing policy. Um, we've recognized all along that the proposal you know, came to us before we'd had that opportunity. The 2019 comprehensive plan laid out the fact that we needed to work on this. And this proposal came along before we'd had that opportunity. So, you know, we're, we're catching up a bit by the fact that there's, you know, an actual live ball on the field um, that we're, we're, you know, trying to create policy um, sort of in, in, a, in a parallel structure, which is always difficult. But even if there was no development on the table, um, this is something that we should be focusing on. And frankly, as I've mentioned at some previous meetings too, I think revisiting some components of the town center plan um, is something that also needs to be done. Because, um, you know, as we've heard here from public comment tonight, there's a lot of work and I'm not at all suggesting that that work needs to be thrown out or that the, the results of, of those um, efforts um, 
you know, shouldn't be uh, adhered to. But at the same time, we've all looked at the downtown and seen that the results have borne out that, you know, in my opinion, that plan is ineffective um, and has some, some flaws to it that need to be corrected. Um, so um, I'd rather that the council be the ones rolling up our sleeves and doing that work uh, rather than rather than assigning and has to be determined um, separate group to look at that. So other comments before we vote on the motion? Go ahead, Councilor Devereaux. I'd just like to make a, a quick comment. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hear what you're saying about um, where we're at right now. However, we, we wouldn't be changing or looking at changing zoning ordinances um, if we had already set, if we already had our policy parameters set. Right now, we're, we're doing it backwards. We're rushing to change all these zoning ordinances. Um, and you're talking about, um, uh, yes, we need to set up policy parameters. Yes, we do. We need to set those up first before we start changing our zoning. We need to know what our policies are. Um, we need to talk to the town. We need to find out what people want. And that's what we did with the comprehensive plan, which was just recently passed. So um, to, uh, I just don't understand why everyone's in such a rush to change our zoning when we haven't set up any policy parameters yet. The thing I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. The thing I disagree with those, the comprehensive plan did very clearly contemplate the fact that the zoning may need to change and that mm -hmm. other, other things may need to change and not even may, you know, likely would need to change in order to accomplish some of the goals and objectives that it stated. And so, in my personal opinion, some of the things that are on the table right now, um, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that we wouldn't arrive at the same place, um, you know, having gone a different, you know, in a different process. Um, I, I fully acknowledge and admit that it's not ideal to do it the, the way it's transpired, um, but the toothpaste is out of the tube on that. And so, um, like I said, I, I personally have the opinion that we we may have landed in in very close to the same spot where we've gotten to, um, regardless. But I hear what you're saying, and we may have. Um, however, um, I, I just want to remind everybody that um, our brand is is not the key bank. Our brand is Fort Williams. Our our brand is open space. That's Cape Elizabeth. And some years ago, there was a vote. Um, four to three to keep Fort Williams as a park because a developer wanted to come in and build and there was no policy parameters set up. Um, and now we look back and think, whoa, we're so glad that that didn't happen. So I'm just saying, let's, let's step back and think about this. Let's set up our policy parameters and then talk about what zoning changes we wanna make. Not just change zoning because someone's come in saying we wanna build we need to really step back and look at what the impacts this is going to have. And I think that it's um, a bigger question than just three people on the ordinance committee. So um, that's my, my thoughts there. Um, any other comments before we call the question on Valerie's motion? Okay, motion on the table uh, is to create an ad hoc committee um, to advise on um, affordable housing policy. Uh, Deb, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? No. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? No. Councilor Penelope Jordan? No. Councilor Noonan? No. Chairman Garvin? No. Motion fails, two yay, five nay. So back to the agenda item. Um, is there, does anybody uh, wish to make a different motion? Penny? I'll move. Um, 
I'll move that we um, send the recommendations to the ordinance committee for uh, review, evaluation, and uh, additional research. I'll second that. Moved by Council Penny Jordan, seconded by Caitlin Jordan. Is there a discussion on that motion? Council Noonan. Sorry, it's uh, another question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just so, um, can, are we able to pull out this separate piece around recommendation number 83 from the comprehensive plan? Like, could that be a separate motion to move that piece to a workshop and take the rest of it to the ordinance committee? Um, we can, yeah, I mean, we can. Or I can Mm -hmm. that that, that was my motion that that was my motion already that we voted on well, no yours was to create a standalone ad hoc committee right take number 83 move it out to create an ad hoc committee to look review number 83 that was my motion Right, I'm t I think I'm saying take 83 to a workshop so we can figure out as, as our manager had talked about um, figuring out an RFP for potentially hiring a <clears throat> professional in this space. Okay, oh, a workshop for the yeah. council, okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I don't mean to confuse things, just wanna. Um, Go ahead, Penny. So, um, that's an interesting um, uh, proposal question. Um, so what we're saying is that the ordinance um, changes option one and et cetera would go to the ordinance committee, but the um, number 83 may uh, take veer out and go to a workshop for the full council in order to identify uh, um, expertise, et cetera. So do them as two, they're going to run in, they're gonna run in tandem, but um, under two separate uh, approaches. I don't have a problem with that. But. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I didn't know. Cause that was my comment earlier about being able to walk and chew gum. We can consider the amendments that are before us right now, as well as the larger picture of, of doing a town-wide study on housing diversity. Can, was Done. my motion seconded or not? Was it? Cause, yes, cause we I thought could, it was. Yeah, can, Caitlin did. We, yeah. Because we can do a friendly amendment, correct? Yeah, I would agree. Along with those Can we? I think your motion and Deb maybe read it back to me to be keep me on. I, I thought your motion actually was just from the wording uh, refer to the, the ordinance, ordinance committee. Is, yeah. The option one. So is that, is that what you had, Deb? I I didn't. It, you didn't make reference to. You didn't make reference to. Number 83. Plan 83 in your motion, in your original exactly. motion anyway. Right. So exactly. Okay, good. Okay, okay. I think we so am I clear that your your motion, which Caitlin seconded, is to refer the option one amendment, uh, zoning amendments to the ordinance committee, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Run, so is there, further dis okay. <laughs> is there further discussion on that clarified current motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Deb, you wanna call a roll for that vote then? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? No. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries one yay, 
six. Six years. Oh, yeah. Six years. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, is anybody like to make? Would anybody like to make a subsequent motion um, on this agenda item? Councilor Noonan. I will. Sure. I move that we take um, recommendation number 83 from the comprehensive plan to a workshop. Second. Second. Uh, motion by Councilor Noonan, seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, is there discussion on this? Seeing none. Uh, Deb, go ahead. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Um, okay. Um, next is item number 88-2021, a request to amend the chapter 19 zoning ordinance relating to agricultural buildings. Um, both councilors Jordan have um, uh, pre-indicated a conflict of interest on this. So both will be um, sitting out this item. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? I see one hand raised, uh, Lynn Sayre. Matt will open your mic in just a second, Lynn. Go ahead, your name and address, please. Lynn Sayre, 61 Brentwood Road. Just a quick question on the previous uh, but could you just do a quick summary of where we landed before we move forward, just so that we're all clear sure. on what's moving forward. Thank you very much. So um, I'm happy to do that. Thanks. Um, so uh, the option one amendments that were brought forward by the planning board will be referred to the ordinance committee uh, for continued review and uh, going through the the revisions process, uh, if there are revisions to be made beyond what was brought forward. And eventually then they will be brought back if voted out of the ordinance committee to the town council for action to be taken by the town council. Subsequently, uh, we voted to refer item number 83 from the comprehensive plan, um, which um, is very specifically um, an item in the plan that uh, it, uh, it suggests that the town undertake a housing diversity study um, and that various options to evaluate should include uh, incentives for creating uh, permanently affordable housing, potentially the municipal purchase of land and other coordination with other regional efforts in the area. And so that is going to be discussed at a future council workshop and I imagine that future action might entail designating um, uh, some specific group to, to work specifically on any action items that come um, from that discussion and workshop. And it sounded like the majority of the council favored the manager um, likely uh, working to develop an RFP uh, that an external um, subject matter expert on regional affordable housing would be brought in to consult with the council and provide um, potential policy recommendations. Does that answer your question? I don't know. I, I, it looks like Lynn's mic is closed now, but hopefully that did. Um, uh, okay, so back to um, item number. 88-2021, um, both Councilors Jordan um, abstaining from the discussion. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Um, and I can give you a quick summary. The um, 
William H. Jordan Farm is requesting consideration of amending chapter 19 of the zoning ordinance regarding the size of agricultural buildings. The current ordinance um, states that agricultural buildings should not exceed, I think that's 2,000 square foot in size. It looks like there might be a typo in the agenda. The proposal would increase the size to uh, not exceed 3,000 square feet. Um, so I don't see any hands going up from the public to comment on this. Oh, go ahead, Penny. You're not supposed I to be talking. <laughs> I know. I just want to <laughs> clarify that it's not all agricultural buildings. It's it's high tunnel greenhouses that need to increase. Um, okay. You'll see in the definition that uh, they grouped all the buildings together. But if we could kind of just address greenhouses, I just wanted to clarify that. Pretend I'm Thank a member you. of the public. OK. Um, is there? Um, so the, the recommended um, action on this tonight is to refer this to the planning review board to, for review, hopefully a lighter lift than the last thing we sent to them. Um, but is there uh, anybody who would like to make a motion uh, or ask any questions? Oh. Go ahead, Councilor Devereaux. Um, so move. Um, let's see here. That's Sorry, fine. I'm in the. Yep. I'm in the. Nope. Uh, refer, refer the or, refer the. Refer to the ordinance size of yes. to the to the planning board, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes Is yes, there a yes. second? Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Any discussion? I'm just curious, and um, and maybe um, Penny or Caitlin knows the answer to this. Um, I'm I'm sure there must be larger sizes, like the three thousand square foot in other towns. Is that a typical size, or would it need to be even larger? I'm just curious of um, what sizes people are using on farms. The standard size at this point in time is 2,880 square feet. Um, and some are using a little bit smaller. Um, um, we could stuff at Jordan's farm, what made sense, because you don't want to go too big because then you're getting a bit uh, industrial. Um, so these are uh, high tunnels, uh, uh, not rigid greenhouses. So um, we thought that was the most, um, I would say, uh, logical maximum at this point. Okay, I was just curious of what the typical sizes are. All right, thanks. Any other discussion on the uh, motion to refer this to the planning board for their review and uh, report back to the council? Seeing none. We'll have a vote on this, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries five yeas. Thank you. Um, is there, that's the end of our regular agenda. Uh, is there anybody from the public remaining? Uh, about 20, uh, 13. Oops. You have one more item, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Sorry, uh, oh, sorry about that. What, oh, why, oh, sorry. We all came on the seat belt at the same time. So close. So close. All right. Next up is uh, item number 89-2021, wireless infrastructure amendment. Is there anybody from the public that would like to talk about this? We've got about 13 folks left in the audience. Um, anybody that would like to... Um, talk about the fact that town staff is recommending a zoning ordinance to be amended to clarify how new wireless infrastructure should be treated as a land use. Um, Matt, I, this is related to discussion we've had um, at recent workshops and goal planning and stuff like that about sort of getting the policy in place before we actually take action on any plans and projects, right? So uh, can you uh, expand on that at all? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that that is exactly what we're the attempt is with this, uh, because uh, at present time, uh, where the where the industry seems to be going for five G and small cell technology currently is undefined in the ordinance. Uh, so, if one of the council goals is to uh, help improve cellular coverage within the town of Cape Elizabeth, uh, this would be a, a, a an opportunity that may be available. And if the if the enabling legislation is in place to allow that prior to, uh, and, and it almost happened the opposite way. You know, I had a couple of pre, uh, proposals that were coming forward that did not move forward. So uh, in this case, we're hoping they'd be ahead of the uh, ahead of the horse, or ahead, ahead of the cart, sorry, had to reverse there, but that's what we're looking to, to do with this, with this amendment. Thanks. Um, so the recommended action is to refer this to the ordinance committee for them to work on. Uh, is there any council that would like to make a motion? Seeing no uh, public comment. Council Gabrielson, go ahead. Um, I'd like to make the, so the motion in the agenda um, refers this to the zoning, to the um, council. I'd like to make the, I'd like to amend that slightly to also include um, that the ordinance committee has a charge to look at some other, you know, working with experts to, um, understand what our range of options are, um, similar to the, the discussion we just had around affordable housing. So the, the motion I would make is that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council refers to the ordinance committee proposed amendments to chapter 19 zoning ordinance relating to how, how new wireless infrastructure should be treated as a land use and also engage um, with appropriate experts on recommendations for other policies to expand cellular coverage. I second that. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Thank you, Chair. Great. Uh, any discussion further to that? Go ahead, Councilor Devereux. I, I, that sounds like a good idea. I'm just wondering, do we want to send it to the Ordinance Committee to do that or to the Energy Committee? Um, they might have the time to engage professionals and they, um, I would think they would know quite a bit about technology. Just a thought. Um, I'm fine with it either way. I'm just thinking the ordinance committee has so much going on. Um, maybe the energy committee could take that last half on. Uh, go ahead, Penny. When I saw this item on the agenda, one of the things um, that I had thought about is exactly where Jeremy's at in order for us to do this and do this appropriately. Uh, we really need to have an architecture in place. And so we need to talk to some experts. So we'd be talking to, in order to do this, we would be talking to some experts anyway to get some advice. Uh, I mean, the ordinance committee, when as we function, uh, we reach out to various parties in order to make sure that we are informed about um, um, the uh, area in which we're being asked to make decisions on. So we would do that anyway. Do you agree, Jeremy? Um, Valerie, I think I understand where you're going. I, I don't know that this falls directly under their somewhat tailored charge of, and I'm not, I, I don't know, while it's, while it's a utility and a communications technology, I, I don't know that it really qualifies as energy is, is my only hang up there. And I, I understand where you're going in terms of, you know, making sure we don't bottleneck the ordinance committee, but I, I also am just not sure that it, it really falls under their charge and purview. So um, that's, a, that, that's my only response to that, but I appreciate what you're thinking though about it. So um, other comments? Okay, uh, let's keep the ordinance committee busy. Um, Deb, can we vote on this one, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Yeah. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Amy, we didn't have short-term rentals anymore, so we needed something to do on the ordinance committee. So <laughs> yeah. I will say yes. I want you guys Co getting lazy. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Um, 
Okay, now is there anybody remaining in the meeting that wishes to speak about something that was not on our agenda? We have 12 folks left in the audience. Um, seeing none, before we adjourn, um, I did happen to notice an email came across while we were in the meeting um, and it specifically relates to participation and access um, to the meeting. Um, so somebody who was, I think what I'm gleaning from this was listening on their phone and was not sure how to raise their hand or um, be recognized to um, participate in the public comment period. Um, first of all, thank you to that person um, for the comments that you submitted. Um, council will um, review those and as, as if you had um, delivered them to, this, to us in the meeting. But um, <clears throat> I know we include in our at the top of the agenda um, the the dial in information, which I know people can use if they're not on a web based platform um, in order to participate in the meeting. Matt and Deb, maybe we can. Um, I know that there's a little sort of uh, you know step one, step two kind of thing that maybe we can just add to the agenda so that people have it right there. Um, so that they know press one to raise your hand or, or all those kinds of things. I thought we had that somewhere before and, and maybe it just fell off at some point. But in any case, if we could just get that back on there, um, just so that anybody joining by phone can have equal opportunity, that would be great. We'll do, Mr. Um, yep, and apologies to that person who, who was unable to participate. Um, is there any other comments from anybody on the council before we adjourn? Then would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Now, so Caitlin second. Jordan, is there a second? Penny, second. any discussion? Seeing none, one last time, if you could, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. And it carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all of your time tonight. Thank you for everybody from the public that joined and for your comments. And thank you to again to Jim and the planning board um, for their work on, on the main agenda item tonight. See you all next time. Night. Good night, everyone.